Good morning, everyone. And let me first apologize because I'm not with you. I have to say the spirit is very willing, but the flesh is very weak. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk to you today about HPV vaccines. Now, I'll start off with a brief overview of the burden of disease and the virus and its biology. And then the, um, the vaccines that are available and the impact that's been observed of um, implementing these vaccines in populations to date. And then I'm going to finish with what is the current most uh, heated discussion, which is do we need one dose of this vaccine or two? So the burden of disease of HPV is, is really very substantial. 5% of all cancer cases globally are, can be attributable to HPV. The biggest one, of course, is cervical cancer in women, where virtually 100% of cases are HPV caused. But then there's anal cancer, uh, cancer of the oropharynx, particularly basic tongue and tonsil, vulva, vagina, and penis. And they're in both men and women, Although some are more represented in men, such as oropharynx in high-income countries, uh, anal cancer is pretty well uh, distributed, but men who have sex with men uh, who are HIV-infected, it's frankly at epidemic proportions. Now, the um, cervix cancer is preceded, of course, by precancers, which are detected um, by screening, and that, until the arrival of the vaccine, was a major method of preventing invasive cervical cancer. So apart from the uh, burden of malignant disease, there's also this really substantial burden of genital warts. Now, they don't kill you, but basically the patients don't like them, and they cost money to treat, so they're a health economic cost. Now, let's look at this virus, human papilloma viruses. They're small, non-enveloped DNA viruses, there, it's a huge family. There are more than 180 types of HPV. There's actually of some, up into the 200s. And they have two important parts of their biology. They're absolutely host-restricted. So human viruses only infect humans, rabbits only infect rabbits, etc. And they have a strictly intra-epithelial life cycle. So they only go through a full um, productive infection in fully differentiated squamous epithelia. But they infect cells and they have some level of gene expression in cells which have got the potential for squamous um, differentiation. And the ones that have received huge attention are those which infect the internal mucosae, the squamous mucosae of women and men. And they fall into two groups. Those are caused warts, 6 and 11, and true cancer-causing viruses. These are true human cancer viruses. There are 13 types recognized as this, the most important of which is HPV-16, which is the most pathogenic, followed by 18. And then all these other guys at the bottom are basically bit players. Now, 16 causes something wherever you are on the planet is likely to be found in at least 60% of cervix cancers. 18, 7 to 20% is much more uh, heterogeneous. But all these other guys contribute a relatively small amount, only perhaps 2 to 3%. But collectively, of course, they bring up the 100% causation for cervix cancer. Now, the virus structurally is simple but beautiful. So its uh, capsid consists of two proteins, uh, L1, the major capsid protein, and that's assembled into these little rosettes or pentamers across the surface of the, of the particle. And they consist of five L1 molecules, and they are the ones which have the um, neutralizing epitopes. It's against L1 that you make neutralizing antibody. And when you look at the crystal structure of L1, you can see that there are these loops that protrude. And they protrude from the surface of the pentamer, and they encode the 
neutralizing epitopes in the tips of these loops. And so actually, when you look at very high resolution on this particle, it's a bit like a sea urchin with waving tendrils, which are intensely immunogenic. Now, we exploit this structure uh, in the production of the, of the vaccines. And the vaccines consist of virus-like particles comprised only of the major coat protein L1. So they're a subunit protein vaccine. And it's a, a, a theoretically a simple process. You clone out L1, express it in a recombinant microbe that grows obligingly strongly. It makes huge amounts of L1 protein. They self-assemble into the pentamer, and then stochastically they come together and form these uh, virus-like particles, which have no DNA, so they're not infectious, but they are intensely immunogenic. Now, the commercially available vaccines uh, are virus-like protein vaccines, L1 protein vaccines, and they've been licensed since 2006, 2007. All of them target 1618 uh, as uh, their major um, uh, impact, and uh, but also two of them target um, HPV 6 and 11. But so they're a water and cancer vaccine compared to those which are only cancer vaccines. So we've got Cervix from GSK, which is adjuvanted with one of their stable of novel adjuvants, uh, the immunomodulator MPL, which is an agonist of TNR4. Then the two Gardasil vaccines from Merck, the first Gardasil 4, which is 6, 11, 16, and 18. And then the what was the new kid on the block in 2014, Gardasil 9, which is a non-avalent vaccine, and it has um, nine uh, types, uh, in, in addition to 16, 18, 6, and 11, five additional oncogenic types. So the two early vaccines, Cervix and Gardasil 4, should target 70% of cervix cancers. Uh, Gardasil 9, in theory, should deal with 90%. Now, the schedule for these um, vaccines is, is interesting. Remember, it's a subunit protein vaccine. So when they were um, in, initially introduced and, and in trials, the manufacturers used what was um, the regular uh, schedule for a subunit protein vaccine, a prime, prime boost, zero, one, and six months. And... But then in 2014, the schedules changed because randomized controlled trials showed that if you gave two doses in a prime boost regimen of 0, 6 to 12 months in adolescents who were likely to be the target, then you got antibody concentrations as good or better than three doses of this vaccine in the same group. So in a this is, was the situation until about two years ago, and then we had now have three more vaccines approved for uh, 2023 by WHO pre-qualified. So there's two Chinese vaccines settle in from Innovax with a 16 and 18, uh, Wallvax, uh, which has 16 and 18, and Servavac from the Serum Institute of India, a quadrivalent HPV uh, vaccine authorized in India for 9 to 26-year-olds. Now, these products have massively changed the landscape by enhancing supply, because supply was a major problem, particularly during the COVID outbreak. So this is what's available at the moment for um, HPV vaccines. So, we've got the vaccines. Who do we immunize? Well, in most countries with the national programs, the vaccine has been given routinely to 9 to 15 year old girls and increasingly uh, 9 to 15 year old boys for a variety of reasons. Why do we do this? Why would girls target it? Well, 
This is a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, infection occurs early after the onset of the sex, of start of the sexual life. And importantly, the immune response to the vaccine is better in adolescents than in older girls and women. Uh, particularly once you hit puberty, then the um, antibody response to these vaccines declines, but not significantly, it's just a gentle fall off. Now, cervix cancer, of course, is the most prevalent HPV-associated cancer. So if cervical cancer prevention is the rationale, then girls' vaccination is the most cost-effective, and that's what people have targeted. Do we know what the effectiveness of these vaccines are? Well, they've been out in uh, pro programs, in national uh, immunization programs, for more than 10 years now. So we have 10 years of information. But it's for a two or three dose schedule with female only vaccination. That's what I'm going to show you. And where, what, what have we found? Well, where vaccine coverage is high, this is a prerequisite. And up by high, I mean, you must have more than 70% immunized and you're delivering the to the adolescent cohort. And that's, as you might think, you want a high coverage and you want to give it to people who have not been exposed. If those two criteria are satisfied in women under 30 years, because that's all we have the data for, for impact, then there's uh, reductions in disease are quite stunning. So genital warts has been reduced by more than 90%. Uh, the high-grade pre-cancer for the cervix, CIN3, has virtually been eliminated in the under-30s in countries such as the UK and Australia. And cervical cancer, the first data we have is that cervical cancer is reduced substantially, by substantially, I mean more than 80% in the under-30s. The HPV-16 prevalence, the level of circulating virus, a key factor, has been reduced again dramatically, 16 by more than 75%, 18 by 85%. And there are strong herd effects. The herd immunity is extremely important for this. And so you see this in men who have sex with women. Their genital loss disappears as the coverage in the girls goes up and in unvaccinated women older than the vaccinated cohort. So this is a highly effective vaccine. And I'll show you what I think is probably the most important data. And this is from Falcaro and colleagues published in The Lancet, and is looking at the um, cumulative incidence rate per 100,000 of invasive cervical cancer and the high-grade pre-cancer, CIN3, in the UK cohorts. And this is registry data, so they've gone to the registries, looked at the number, how many service cancers have appeared at the different age groups, how many CIN3s, and correlated it with the vaccination coverage. So if you look at cohort 4, which is blue, these are unvaccinated girls. And the, the impact on cervix cancer, they continue to acquire uh, lesions. Then cohort five, which is in green, these are vaccinated girls in our catch-up program. We had a catch-up for 16 to 18. The coverage in the catch-up was not ideal. So we got 60% and 44% for one dose and three doses. And there's an impact, but it's not dramatic. Then we look at cohort six. Now, these are girls vaccinated in the school program. They're still part of the so-called catch-up, but they're in school. So the coverage goes up, and they are, if for one dose, 80%, for three, three doses, they have about 76%. And there is an impact. Now, remember, they're vaccinated at 14 to 16. There are only 26 
when these data are acquired um, from the, the registry databases. And then the 12 to 13 year olds, their uh, coverage was very high. We had very high coverage in, a, in that in our school based program. And there's hardly any service cancer. I have to point out that in the UK, the most common cancer in women under the age of 35 is cervical cancer. So these, the, these are really rather important um, data, and they fully justify the statement that the authors made that the immunization program has set successfully almost eliminated cervix cancer in women born since September the 1st, 1995. So these are hugely effective vaccines. So what's happening in the rest of the world? Well, cervical cancer is not a huge problem in the UK in the sense that we have an excellent screening program and therefore control incidents quite well. But in countries which have fragile health systems or poor infrastructure uh, and uh, just frankly not enough medical services, it's a major problem. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's either the first or second most common cancer in women. So this is, the vaccine is needed desperately in these countries to reduce mortality and morbidity. So how are we doing? Badly. The global vaccine coverage it was not very good before COVID, and when COVID arrived, it plummeted. So for the for one dose, uh, the maximum achieved was twenty percent. For the three doses, it went to 13%, and for boys, it was even worse. And as I say, the arrival of COVID just fractured the system. And uh, it was a slow uptake before that, and you might need to compare that, for example, with rotavirus or uh, meningitis. It, it, uptake of HPV was poor. So Why? Why is the global coverage so low? Well, that HPV vaccines face really quite substantial hurdles. And the first is cost. It's an expensive vaccine. But, the, but giving it to adolescents puts on another big layer of costs. But, uh, the best way is probably via school programs, but then the logistics become quite tricky. And the implementation and administration costs are substantially greater, actually, than the vaccine. And then there's the logistics. It's hard enough to get one dose into uh, girls in rural communities in um, uh, low-income countries. And you can see that there might be difficulty in delivering two or three doses where there's no infrastructure for immunization, for adolescent immunization. And the other thing is, there's a very long interval between exposure and disease. How do you convince someone that this is important, that you're giving a, a, a vaccine, an injection at the age of nine or ten to prevent a disease that's going to be coming uh, in their 40s and 50s? And uh, it's a vaccine against a sexually transmitted infection. You're giving it to adolescent girls. This gives rise to a gossip a storm, particularly with misinformation on the risks to fertility in that cohort. And it's against this background that we have the one dose discussion. Uh, do we actually need two or three doses? Will one dose of this vaccine be enough? A totally radical idea for a subunit protein vaccine. Well, the first evidence that this radical idea might have some value came from a post hoc analysis of the Costa Rica vaccine trial, uh, it, the randomized control trial, one of the pivotal trials for licensure of the bipedan vaccine, where women 18 to 25 were randomized to receive three doses of the vaccine or a control, but 
not all of them completed the full series and were available for follow-up, quite a lot in fact, uh, if compared to other vaccine trials, were either had two doses or one dose. And they were followed up very carefully, and you can see three years after uh, the last vaccine dose, in terms of efficacy against persistent infection. Now, persistent infection is required, is the best in pro prognostic factor for the development of neoplastic disease. And it's, it doesn't matter whether in one, two or three doses, you were protected. Uh, many people, including myself, were very cynical about this. It was a, a roundabout, it was a post hoc analysis and the op options for uh, bias were substantial. But then 11 years later, they're still following them up and they have essentially the same uh, result. Um, the women who had one, two or three doses, it didn't matter which dose you had, they were still protected against persistent infection. Now, if you aren't infected, you don't get the disease. So this is a pretty good surrogate. But even so, there it's always been there are too many questions were sent to, to um, really accept this data. But at the same time, there was a very interesting set of data coming out of India. And this was a study that was initially planned as a randomized control trial to compare two versus three doses in the, um, in the um, adolescent late teen population. And the eligibility for this were unmarried, unvaccinated girls between 10 and 18. Um, India is a highly conservative country, and it could be safely assumed that unmarried girls 10 to 18 were sexually inactive and virgins. And the plan was to recruit 10,000 girls into each arm, and nine sites participated in this, and they started in 2009, and then the government of India stopped HPV vaccination in April 2010 for reasons totally unrelated to this trial. But when they stopped it serendipitously, uh, the girls fell into four groups. Those who had three doses, who had two doses in the 06 root uh, regime, those who had two doses in the 02, and those who had one dose. And the numbers were pretty equivalent. They stopped vaccination, but they didn't stop follow-up. And so these girls were rigorously followed up with persistent infection as their outcome. And when the, the girls uh, started their sexual life, as indicated either by pregnancy or marriage, then they were could have vaginal swabs taken and the DNA detection performed. And you can see at the 10-year data presented by uh, Basu in 2021, again, it doesn't matter whether you're one, two, or three. <clears throat> now, there, again, there have been questions raised about the trial. It's not a randomized control trial. Uh, and India is interesting because it has this huge population therefore a huge burden of disease, but a relatively low uh, virus prevalence, low levels of circulating virus. So the question was, well, it may work in this scenario, but what happens in a heavily infected population? And anyway, it's not a randomized controlled trial. Well, that um, set of um, criticisms has been addressed recently by the Kenshi trial, which was the efficacy of a single dose of HPV in young uh, African women. Uh, this was done in Kenya, um, and the women who were enrolled were 15 to 20. They were uh, had no vaccine, uh, they were DNA negative, they were HIV negative, and they lived um, permanently in, their, in Kenya. And they were randomized to receive the nine-valent vaccine, and then cross over to a meningococcal or a bivalent vaccine with a crossover, and the control group having an immediate meningococcal and delayed HPV. 
and they presented the um, published their first interim analysis uh, after 18 months. And uh, the vaccine efficacy after one dose of HPV, either of the nine or two-valent vaccine, against persistent 16-8 infection is 97.5, a very tight confidence limit. Now, <coughs> recently, at uh, the most recent papillomavirus meeting, they presented their 36-month data, and you can see that this protection against persistent infection is retained. And against the additional types, the, the um, vaccine efficacy against the uh, additional five types in the non-avalent vaccine was equally high, but of the slightly lower band of the confidence limit. But looking at the uh, 36-month data, these um, the efficacy is strong, and the uh, lower band is uh, significantly higher. So, in summary, um, this trial, a randomized control trial, showed that adolescent girls and young women were effectively protected from HPV infection in the first 36 months post-vaccination. And the vaccine efficacy was 97%. Now, one of the really important aspects of this trial is that it was done in Kenya. And I have to point out that East Africa is the cervical cancer capital of the world, and the virus prevalence is very high. So this trial is being conducted in one of the highest regions for circulating virus, and it dramatically walks down the level of persistence. And it's a very well-designed trial, high fidelity to the protocol, retention, and clear ascertainment of outcomes. But there are other aspects to it which I think are crucial. This is a trial conducted, designed, and implemented by Africans in Africa for Africans. They have ownership of the data. They engage their communities in recruitment. And there is confidence in this, in these findings, because they've been done in the locale where it's important. And that's a, it's a, a really important um, uh, finding, I think, or observation for people who are planning trials. Now, the data I've shown you, which was presented to WHO for SAGE last year, is about efficacy. And I think it's quite compelling. But... But there's an issue, and there's still questions, and it's about immunogenicity. Now, antibody concentrations after one dose, irrespective of the trial, are inferior to two or three. But the antibody kinetics are the same for one, two, or three. So you get the initial peak, then a fall off, and then a plateau level about six to 12 months post the final dose. And this plateau remains stable. 50, irrespective of one, two, or three, it's stable and antibody decay is minimal. Antibody avidity, which is functional affinity, is the same for one, two, or three doses. And this changes minimally over time. And this is interesting because one implication is that antibody quality, but the implication is that affinity maturation is completed even after one dose. And then the immunobridging shows that antibody concentrations for one dose are as good in adolescents as in 16 to 23-year-old females in whom efficacy has been demonstrated. Now, this is the data which was presented to um Sage in uh, 2022, and uh, the, with the, the important point that there's no immune correlate, we don't know how much antibody you need. And this, the persistence of antibody has come from the uh, Costa Rica vaccine trial, and you can see what I mean by the stability of the 
antibody after three or one dose. And this is after 10 years. And they have uh, now data uh, up to 16 years, which is no different. So antibody remains stable, but lower, but efficacy remains solid. And the position paper from WHO with their recommendations was that you could have a one or two dose schedule for girls 9 to 14 and a one or two dose schedule for girls and women aged 15 to 20 as a result of data from both all those three trials. And, but for women older than 21, we have no data for one dose. Two doses with the six-month interval are still indicated. So what do we need to do? We need to up coverage. And I um, urge you to sign this global decoration for, to eliminate cervical cancer. This is a, a, um, an initiative sponsored by the Gates Foundation, and it's tried to raise the profile to generate coverage because we could argue and argue and argue about one, two or three doses. What we can't argue about is what it absolutely requires is high coverage in whatever population you immunize. It's no point keeping the vaccine in a vial. It's got to go into the arm. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was a lovely, lovely presentation. And we'll open it up for questions right here. Thank you very much for that really uh, interesting talk. I'm Catherine. Um, is there any programmatic reason why we wouldn't start vaccinating at a younger age, like five-year-olds during their sort of school um, uh uh, school catch-up vaccinations and whatnot. Is there is there a program reason or just sort of a social reason? It, it's because there's no um, evidence from trials that um, it's it's safe and that the um, Im immune response is strong enough. I mean, you, I'm sure it is safe. And I'm sure the immune response. Is, in fact, there's a trial in the Gambia of which I'm an investigator looking at this. Where we have, uh, we're immunizing four to five year olds as well as nine, uh, you know. And so it's simply that we don't have the evidence at the moment. And there may well be programmatic reasons. I'm, I'm an implementer, but it, it might solve a lot of problems. You could give one dose early in life and then come back in as an adolescent. Right, let's go right here. Yep, right there. Thank you. I'm Pamela from Cameroon. Uh, my question is on the different types of, of uh, the HPV vaccines. We know they're non-avalent, they're bivalent. Uh, I just wanted to know which ones precisely are indicated for programmatic and which ones are not, and what is the reason behind, um, what is the reason behind their the selection in programs and why others are not selected for programs in wide scale use. Thank you. Well, the, um, the, the three new vaccines from China and India are at the moment restricted to their countries of origin, but the um, other vaccines are the decision which vaccine is to be used is a, a country specific decision. So you look at um, uh, the cost effectiveness, um, your own burden of disease. Uh, these are all the factors. So it's there is no input, there's no recommendation from WHO or any other body that you use one or the other. They all give you the same um, out, uh, efficacy. So it's a question of. What is suitable? What can you afford? What is the price? What's the best way to do it? We'll move. Oh, my goodness. Move to the back of the room. Let's see. Um, why don't we go second row in the back, second from the right. Yes. I think is it Allie? No. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, good morning. My name is Lisa from the U.S. 
Thank you so much for your talk. The data um, about the one dose is very, very exciting. Um, my question is about uh, the framework for the HPV vaccine. Um, I find that intervention that primarily target women and have to do with sexual activity become a little bit embattled around the world often. And I guess my question is, what are organizations and societies doing to maybe change the framework of the HPV vaccine from a, a vaccine um, against an STI into maybe more of a framework to talk about the vaccine as a cancer-preventing vaccine, both for women and men, so for all adults, and um, frame it a little bit in a way that may be more acceptable to multiple cultures around the world. Yes, um, you're absolutely right, and it, it's it's best considered as a gender neutral vaccine, which is an anti cancer vaccine. And um, the obviously the the dominant cancer in low and middle income countries is service cancer. But if you came to high income countries. And, and increasingly, as habits change, for example, uh, head and neck cancer in men in the UK now exceeds cervical cancer in women. So it's it, it this is an equal opportunities virus. It, uh, you know, it doesn't care who it infects, and it can, causes cancer in both sexes. So the messaging should be: this is an anti-cancer vaccine, and it is given to the entire population because both men and women you know, develop HPV associated cancers, and that is the message which is being predominantly adopted in in programs worldwide. Thanks. We'll stay up top right there. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Professor. I'm Emmanuel from Uganda. I'm, uh, you have follow, I've been your follower since 2006. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, I'm a good supporter of the uh, single dose HPV. With all this data, uh, very good data, follow up of 11 years, which is very convincing. Why is the virtual and sage from your perspective? Why are they still kind of indicating either or, or you may, or you may not? Why are they not really saying go with a single dose and that's it? Oh, from your perspective, what does this mean? Thanks. Well, um, <laughs> you're talking to a totally biased individual here. So <laughs> you know, I'm a real one dose advocate. But the issue is duration of protection. And, you know, you, uh, and I'm, I didn't come into this as a vaccinologist. I came into it as a simple pathologist. So, uh, I look at things from a slightly different perspective. But the, uh, you know, the antibody response is undoubtedly lower after one dose. However, the quality of the antibody response and its persistence is the same. So, uh, and that matters. And the more you understand the basic immunology, the more this becomes entirely understandable and rational. But nonetheless, the question remains in people's brains. What's the duration of protection going to be? I, is one dose going to give you 20 and 30 years and 40 years protection? And so those are the things which, you know, people don't always behave in a rational way. And um, so th there's this question. The other thing is, if you run a program uh, in which you've emphasized two and or three doses, to change it and say you only need one, now that's a big hurdle to overcome in communication. Because, for example, uh, when Women parents will say, are you using our children as guinea pigs? Why, why, why have you suddenly changed? Do you just want to save money? Um, so it, moving to a one dose schedule is easy if you haven't got the program in place. It may be quite difficult if you're moving from an established program with two or three doses into one dose. So I think the first thing to say is that rationally, the evidence is solid that one dose will give you prediction. 
it, you could do all sorts of modeling around it, but rationally, one dose seems to protect you for long enough. Even, I mean, the king in data is stunning. As well, you're, from, you're from Uganda, your, your prevalence is equal. And um, if it works there, it's going to work anywhere, in my opinion. So it's, there are, it's not a straightforward matter. Um, changing a schedule, I think is the answer. But the evidence, in my opinion, is pretty compelling. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh. Okay, we're going to start with Liana, then we're going to go here and then there. So I'm Liana, I'm from India. So as we're preparing for the rollout of HPV vaccine, my questions are with regard uh, to the urine test kit, as well as the uh, uh, importance of cell swabbing instead of going to a health facility, so for longer follow-ups. So I, uh, the colleague from Thailand has helped me out with the urine test kits, but I would like to know if you have uh, any advice on use of urine test kits and cell swabbing. Well, I'm not an expert in in this, so I'm you know I I'm not sure I'm ch talking from a platform of competence, but the um, ev the evidence that um, urine testing is as good for women women, not for men, and that's really because uh, that's about the biology of the virus. This is not a focal infection in the female genital tract. It's a field infection. So if you have an infection up in your cervix, you're likely to have it also on the vulva. And therefore, when you um, urinate, the first void of urine comes down across the vulval surface and you wash um, uh, HPV DNA into your urine. And that is the basis for using it as a test. And the, the trials have been done, and they've been done very carefully. And there's a you know, very good correlation between urine positivity and the positivity from a high vaginal swab. So I would be pretty confident that urine worked. What test system you use is uh, again, how you collect and how you instruct the women how to collect. I think collection in all these things becomes important because it's got to be the first void of urine because by the time you get to the second one, you've washed off the surface of the vulva. I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but uh, as I say, I, I'm not an expert on this. Thank you. Yep, we may only have time for one more question, so we'll go here and then check the time. Okay, thank you. My name is Brant from uh, from Uganda. Uh, in the data you presented, uh, efficacy has been demonstrated against persistent infection, and the target of uh, immunization is to target those who have not been exposed. So, is what is the role of the vaccine in those who have had exposure? Does the vaccine still have any role? Um, well, this is a prophylactic vaccine, so let's be quite clear. It's not going to change the natural history of the infection. So if you're infected and you vaccinate, this will not stop you clearing the, the virus by natural immune responses. It will not stop um, the, the infection persisting and it will not stop the infection progressing to a near plastic level. So the natural history is unimpaired if, if you're already infected when you vaccinate. What it will stop you doing, almost certainly, is transmitting, because um, the uh, antibody is um, diffused across the, the vaginal and cervical epithelium, so any virus which is being shed is likely to be neutralized by antibody in the um, vaginal and cervical secretions. So it may not change the effect of the individual, but it may reduce the probability of that individual transmitting the virus. And remember, vaccines are highly effective because they block transmission 
That's why the reduction in prevalence is so important. The, um, uh, I'm not sure I can say very much more than that. Uh, so it's, you will, if you take, for example, the nine valent vaccine, which is, um, uh, the monovalent, if, if you are only infected with 16, then you're protected against everything else. You can argue if you're in a high prevalence region, you might want to have a nine valent vaccine. But vaccinating already exposed individuals probably has a value. 